Hey, Kareem Sirajuddin here, founder of Nude Human Consulting. The Coffee with Kareem podcast aims to provide Muslims and people of all backgrounds a space to share their life gifts, meet dynamic guests, and enhance the human experience one cup of coffee at a time. Sit back and sip. Episode 15, Defining Islamic Psychology. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with Kareem. Today I have Dr. Kerry York al Karam joining us today. She is a current faculty in the Department of International Studies and Department of Religious Studies at the University of Iowa and the director of al Karam Lab for Islamic Psychology. Kerry, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Kerry, would you say there's a difference between spirituality and religion? Because this is something I hear a lot, like, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that distinction. Do you think it's um, important, or it can be confusing? Uh, what, what? Give us your two cents on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. There is this whole debate, and indeed within um, Division 36 of the APA, the American Psychological Association, and of course Division 36 being um, the Society for the Psychology of Religion and Spirituality, um, which I'm an active member in, um, you know, there, there are... A, a, publications where, you know, that's, that's all scholars are talking about. Like, what do we mean by religion and what do we mean by spirituality? So there has been an enormous amount of scholarship that has been, that has addressed the very question that you're asking me. Um, so I don't know if I have any better answers than what those scholars have um, put forth. And I don't know if there really is any sort of current resolution, even if there isn't like an agreed upon definition of religion and spirituality um, within the context of psychology, we can simply put forth um, what we what we mean it to mean within the context of our work. I think answering that question um, has varying levels of importance depending on what the context of the discussion is. If you're just talking about it at the sort of surface level amongst people, um, you know, people on the street, you know, I think for the most part you say religion and spirituality, people have a general vague idea of what you're talking about. It's only really within the realm of um, science and scholarship that we have to really pick that apart and get into the nitty gritty of, of really what what that means and how we define it and what the implications are. Got it. And so how about the term psychology? So this is also um, academically defined or scholar, you know, defined in a scholarly fashion. Would you say that's accurate? So on the one hand, sort of working definition we have in psychology, if you sort of look at, if you look up at Wikipedia on the internet, or if you open any, you know, Psych 101 textbook, you'll see psychology is defined as the study of behavior and mental processes. So, but then, and, and so that's great. That's, we kind of all know what you're talking about when somebody says psychology, but then when you sort of get into peel away the layers and get into, um, more complex ideas within psychology as sort of a broader term, um, then you face those, those same dilemmas and you will find a lot, um, in, in the published literature that discusses this, like what is really psychology? What is the subject of psychology? What are we really studying in psychology? Um, and, and, and so, you know, that discussion is definitely still out there. Right. But I mean, obviously, if anyone takes a psychology course or studies psychology, there is this broad definition, as you said, right, studying the mental processes and behaviors. In other words, it's almost like just studying a person, right, the individual experience. Now, how that pertains or relates to one's society, one's culture, one's religion, if we want to emphasize more cognitive processes versus behavioral, now we're getting into what we call the branches or approaches of psychology. Yes, exactly, exactly. So you have, you know, you have psychology as this sort of umbrella term, but then within that you have the different subfields of psychology like clinical psychology or social psychology, health psychology, forensic psychology. Um, so these are some of the 
um, you know, clinical neuroscience or, you know, there's, there's a lot of subfields. You really have to, to specify what you're specifically talking about um, when you say psychology. Me personally, although I'm not a clinical psychologist, my interests are very much in clinical psychology in terms of my work with Islamic psychology. It's from very much from like a clinical perspective and dealing with um, uh, abnormal or, um, you know, a abnormal psychology and understanding um, signs and symptoms, diagnoses, and also treatment. So, and, and, and again, that's, that's very different than, you know, social psychology, for example. Right. And uh, so how about this idea of ilm and nafs? Now, I know you, you also have studied the Islamic tradition as far as what are the human sciences in, in Islamic tradition and historically speaking. Um, is this idea of ilm and nafs a real thing? Because some people are, are skeptical about this idea that, oh, you don't need psychology. All your answers are in the Quran and the Sunnah. And then I usually respond with, well, well the Quran and Sunnah is what uh, helps me realize that we, that, there is psychology. I mean, there's ideas of purifying the self and and there's all kinds of existential questions that are addressed in the Quran. Um, there's all kinds of behavioral modeling techniques and, if you will, counseling techniques that you can find with the prophets, with, with the way that they dealt with their people. I mean, we're talking about human transformation here. So how is that separate from psychology? I was wondering what your thoughts are about that um, distinction that some Muslims might think, hey, psychology is over there. It's kind of a secular thing. And we have all of our answers in the Quran and Sunnah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the crux of the issue when it comes to specifically Muslim mental health and uh, misunderstandings that a lot of Muslims have both in the West, in the United States, as well as in the Muslim world. And that is exactly what you said. There's this there's this belief that, you know, psychology is is a Western science and we don't need it. All we need is to increase our faith and follow Islam and we'll be fine. Um, and, and that's just not true. And and that's not even true within the Islamic tradition itself. You know, there's a, there's been a lot there's been a lot published about like the work of early Muslim scholars because you know people talk about oh Islamic psychology this or Islamic psychology that, and then and then people are like well you know what is Islamic psychology and some people will say oh Islamic psychology is the work of early Muslim scholars people like Al Ghazali, um, Al Razis, Ibn Sina, and all of these other people and it's like well yes and no it's like on the one hand yes those early Muslim scholars did do things that we would consider today part of psychology. But if you take, for example, um, the work of al Balhi, now I know Dr. You, you probably know of Dr. Rani Awad, who is the director of the Stanford Muslims and Mental Health Lab. And um, a lot of her work has to do with translating the manuscripts of some of the early Muslim scholars. And one of the one of the works that she's translated had to do with al balhis sustenance of the body and soul. And what she talks about is that he basically, I mean, if you look at the classification in the DSM today of obsessional disorders and phobias, and you look at al balhis classification, they are nearly identical. So in, in that regard, regarding this specific topic, al balhi and again, regarding this, it had nothing to do with Islam. It had to do with his 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 methodology was observation, which is one of the methodologies we use today in psychology. And it really didn't have anything to do with Islam. It had to observe. It had to do with observing people's obsessions and phobias. And he classified that. So when you say you know Islamic psychology is the work of early Muslim scholars, well, right there's an example of okay, he was a Muslim, but regarding this work, it had nothing to do with Islam. So that's not really correct either. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's like when you say Islamic psychology, people have this vague idea of, oh, it means those early Muslim scholars who did this work. But wait a second, their work was kind of like modern day psychology. 
Um, or there's this vague idea that Islamic psychology has to, it's, oh, it's to sawuf, it's just Sufism. Um, and there is some truth to that, but then once you go into that deeper, there's also problems with that argument. And then, you know, this idea that, oh, it's incorporating, you know, Islamic principles or teachings or um, interventions like spiritual therapies. And it's like, yeah, that can be part of it as well, but that's then that's kind of like integration because it's you might be practicing CBT or um, solution focused therapy and then you're incorporating something Islamic into it you know what I mean so there's so many there's there's this whole discussion about coming up with the parameters of what Islamic psychology is and so my work as a researcher as an academic is really um, working towards defining what that is right and so what I understood you say, if I'm, if I'm going to take a stab at summarizing, so number one, early Muslim works in mental health or, or psychology, it just sometimes it's just a matter of, well, they happen to be Muslims, but they're contributing to the field of ancient psychology, so to speak, or, or pre-modern um, psychology. It's, some, it's just like if you take any other class in science, whether it's, I mean, when you study physics, for example, you're going to learn about Isaac Newton, you're going to learn about, you know, early Greek thinkers, and so on and so forth. And even though there were contributions to the field of physics, some of that is no longer applies. And it's not necessarily like we call it Greek science or Greek physics, just because Socrates or Aristotle may have commented about it, right? So similarly, I'm hearing you say, yes, we have Muslims in our history that have contributed to what you may call the field of psychology. But but that's not the same thing as saying it's Islamic per se. Exactly. And this 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 kind of goes into, I think, even a, another question of, well, what is Islamic? And I think that or maybe a simple way to categorize this is like, one, things that are Islamic are obviously sourced from the Quran and Sunnah, right? Like that's kind of the spring of which any knowledge or understanding of reality comes forth. Second is... Um, what is Islamic may be connected to Muslims who have done something in that subject matter. So we usually associate, okay, this must be Islamic philosophy or Islamic science or whatever, because they happen to be Muslims. And then third is maybe it's Islamic if whatever subject matter you're discussing or materializing here happens to reflect the values or ideas or ethos of the Islamic worldview. In other words, these kind of evergreen truths, uh, if you will. And so it's like this idea of, you know, going out to uh, support moms against drunk drivers, for example. It's like the, the organization may not be started by an Islamic intention or by Muslims, but it has an Islamic cause. So does that make it now Islamic, for instance? So there's there's different ways of even discussing what is Islamic, let alone what is Islamic psychology. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so certainly all of those things are being you know, discussed in the literature and in conferences and, um, and amongst, uh, amongst um, you know, psychologists and mental health people who are, who are involved in the development of this, of this um, you know, emerging discipline. But yeah, I mean, going back to what your original question was about this sort of stigma that Muslims have about psychology not being relevant to them. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like part of it is that or is, is there's this idea that, you know, oh, just because it's it comes from the West that it doesn't have relevance to us. And again, that's also not true. And I've, and I've seen a number of articles that have been sort of published on that very topic that talks about, you know, just because it's not some it doesn't it's not cloaked in Islamic terminology doesn't mean that its essence is not Islamic or uh, compatible. And so that's another misconception people have that, oh, just because uh, certain terminology might be English terms or Western concepts, that you have to look beyond that that the surface of that to what it's really pointing at at a deeper level and then decide. And so I think if you put on that sort of lens and then go with this critical overview or critical research into various aspects of psychology, um, I think that you'll you'll come out, um, you know, recognizing that Western psychology isn't quite as 
um, quote unquote, un-Islamic as a lot of people think. You know, I mean, certainly that's not the case in everything. I mean, I think you will find certain things that either might not be um, compatible with an Islamic worldview or might be going against it that um, that are within the Islamic tradition. But I think that that would probably be more in the minority. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I was I was about to challenge you on that because I've certainly heard, you know, this position of well, we need. You know, if we're going to develop a school of thought around psychology or human science, it has to be self-generating from the Islamic tradition. And some people are even saying we should do this even with science today, right? As far as, you know, you do have uh, specific worldviews and cosmology that already from the beginning you have fundamental principles or or constructs that build up these uh, views and and approaches to how we're going to assess and understand reality. So, for instance, like in psychology and Western psychology, you know, there, some people feel uncomfortable with the idea that there's no acknowledgement of a soul or a spirit or the hereafter or, you know, um, the positions on, let's say, sexuality can be different. Um, and so this, of course, is going to influence what's considered a mental illness or not, or what's considered, you know, functional or dysfunctional or neurosis or not, and so on and so forth. And you mentioned earlier that you've, you know, done some research or, or learned about Rukia and, and these types of things. And we know that this opens up a whole other can of worms as far as other energies that exist around the human uh, condition, which which Islam and other religions have discussed. Yeah, well, I mean, my work with Rukia um, specifically, or even even if you want to talk about Reiki, um, which is a, a Japanese energy healing, um, and 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 some have said that you know. Rukia is kind of an Islamic version of Reiki, or Reiki is a Japanese version of Rukia. It's kind of this universal healing. Um, and that is that, you know, researching something like that and seeing how it might be effective on a particular disorder or a particular ailment or whatever is one thing. Explaining why that might be the case, this can be something else explaining explanatory models are kind of something secondary to just simply understanding the nature of how something like a spiritual practice or uh, a spiritual um, intervention or something like that might might work. Whether, you know, the whole idea of getting into the discussion of, oh, this must be God healing them or something, this doesn't come in, this doesn't fall into the framework of the work of a psychologist. So, so explanatory, like what, why is it happening is something else than simply understanding what the impact is. I was simply interested in understand and, and looking at, okay, here are these, here are these participants who are undergoing a treatment. Um, I want to describe their experience with that and how it impacted whatever they were presenting with. The explanation in terms of why that must um, happen in terms of theological explanations or something that you it's very difficult to bring that into the conversation when you're talking about psychology. Because you can't prove it one way or the other. There's no way you can prove one or way or the other that, oh, this is God healing them or or some other concept that's 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 sort of outside of that discussion. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's all, it reminds me of the problem of correlation versus causation, exactly. which is, is very common in science. Exactly. So for those of us that aren't familiar with this, it's like saying, well, every time Kareem steps out of his house and blows his nose, it starts raining. Yeah. <laughs> so does that mean that Kareem is causing it to rain? Because every time he blows his nose, it's like this cosmic you know, signal for it to rain? Or does it happen to just be a correlation? And so this is one of the things that scientists and you know, neuroscientists alike, they're always trying to find out, well, just because someone is praying and we see certain activity in the brain or or certain heart rates changing, is that because of the actual thing that they're saying or is it because of the state that they're in? You know, like, exactly. m- m- for example, if you say la ilaha illallah a hundred times in a row, but you also say Coca-Cola a hundred times in a row, are you going to get the same you know, neurological or, or physiological responses. I mean, that's that's kind of one of those questions that uh, 
could, I think can exemplify what we're what we're saying here. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, w- one of the reasons why I, I wanted to have you on today is because I'm very excited about your second book that you're working on uh, called Islamically Integrated Psychotherapy: Processes and Outcomes of Muslim Clinicians. So tell us more about this um, project and and why it's it's very exciting for at least uh, those those who are in the field. Yeah, so there's a lot of clinicians out there, as I mentioned before, I myself am not a clinician, but my interests in psychology are in clinical psychology, um, uh, but as a researcher. So, you know, you hear a lot of clinicians out there that have been talking about that they're integrating Islamic therapies and practices and um Uh, principles and teachings and that sort of thing into their psychotherapeutic practice. And and, and the majority of these Muslim therapists are trained in the West. They're either, you know, experts in cognitive behavioral therapy or humanistic psychology. So they have their own Western trainings, but then they sort of incorporate Islamic therapies or teachings into that. And so what I found is that everybody's kind of working on their own. Like this person is doing this here and that person is doing that here. And there hasn't been really any cohesion. And so and so that's what I'm doing right now. All of the authors, we have about 13 or 14 chapters and all of the authors are Western, mostly Western trained Muslim clinicians. And they all practice a variety of forms of psychotherapy and they incorporate the Islamic practices. And so their chapters will be sort of a bird's eye view into their therapeutic practice. MashaAllah, very excited. Tawfiq, inshallah. Well, I do. I do want to mention, though, that, um, you know, I think I think spiritually integrated psychotherapy or within the Islamic context, we're, we're kind of calling it Islamically integrated psychotherapy, that that is not necessarily synonymous with Islamic psychology, which we were what we were talking about a little while ago, that that um, Islamic psychology is sort of the broader um discipline. And I think um, Islamically integrated psychotherapy is just one slice of that larger Islamic psychology pie. Got it. So what would be a broad definition of the discipline of Islamic psychology? Do you have uh, something to offer there? Yeah, so I do. Um, And one of the I'll, I'll just sort of give a plug for one of the other projects that I'm working on. I'll be chairing a seminar um, in Qatar in April, and that will be held at the Center for Islamic Legislation and Ethics. And so the title of that seminar is Islamic Psychology Defining a Discipline. And the focus and scope of that seminar is to actually work towards the delineation and definition of this emerging modern day discipline. So, um, so we, we, we do have some deliverables of that seminar, which will be a publication by Brill publishers. So I'm not anticipating that to be until probably the end of next year. We will have something tangible that we'll be able to give the public and our fellow, um, psychologists and scholars and researchers so that we have some sort of foundation and parameters of this discipline that we can be working from so that scholarship has a place to be rooted and that we can sort of know uh, in a bit more certain terms, even if in only general terms, I'll be happy to share the de- the discipline or the the definition. So the definition, how I define Islamic psychology, is the interdisciplinary space where psychology, subdisciplines, and or related disciplines engage scientifically about a particular topic and at a particular level with various Islamic sects, sources, sciences, and or schools of thought using a variety of methodological tools. I mean, I'm, I'm just so excited that this is even happening, this conference, and, you know, that we have academics and scholars alike coming together to do their best to define this discipline. And I think it's wonderful that this is even, you know, an effort that's materializing. So God bless everybody who's involved with that. And uh, inshallah, you know, we can start to see, um, as you said, a, a cohesive system um, that at least a, a set of scholars can agree to to get us started on this because there's so much more work to be done. Yeah, no, it is. It is very exciting. It's really the core foundational 
um, stuff that we're going to be looking at at this conference. Things about this project is that because it's it's um, sponsored by Kyle, the um, the the publication will be open access. So everybody will be able to access it for free online. Exquisite. Now, one thing that came up for me was it sounds like we're really trying to define Islamic psychology as a science, so to speak. Right now, what do we do when we hit that wall of this idea of the soul or the unseen um, as a scientific discipline trying to emerge called Islamic psychology? As a scholar yourself, Dr. Carey, I mean, how do you think these hard problems could be addressed? And look to what Quran and Sunnah have, so the primary Islamic sources, say about um, the nature of the stealth and just have that be your starting point. If Freud could say, oh, uh, here's the id and the ego and the superego, and this is my theory of personality has what he has to offer. Well, why can't those terms and those concepts come from a religious tradition? So, so if that's the starting point, um, you can build a science based on that. So if we talk about ilm and nafs and the science of the self and all of the things within the Islamic tradition that are related to things that we today call psychology, if we just leave them there, then they're in the realm of theology and religion. And we take this and bring it into the realm of science. That's what I think a lot of us are trying to do in Islamic psychology. It's like, so if you even want to talk about like the nature of the self or the different components of the self from an Islamic perspective, things that you can find in primary and secondary sources, things like the qalb and the nafs and the ruh and the aql, things that have been published about almost extensively in the psychological literature, even today over the last 10 years. If you can start with that as your starting point and bringing that into the realm of psychological science, and in, like for example, you know, if you have, if you, if you can say, okay, from the Islamic perspective, an aspect of the self is the qalb. And we know that because that's what primary sources um, discuss. And if you say that, you know, like, for example, Imam al-Mawlud in the Purification of the Heart book um, translated by Hamza Youssef, there are nearly 25 disorders of the heart, of this aspect of the person whole different conceptualization of psychopathology than psychopathology as is found in the DSM. It is a distinct type of psychopathology, but we can study it scientifically. How? Well, if we, we can start to understand the nature of the qalb from the religious sources, but then how do you as a clinician diagnose somebody that has a disease of the heart? You need measurements. We don't have them now. So it's still left within the realm of theology or even like the nefs. So if you're having somebody, if you're sitting in session with somebody and you want to diagnose them, you know, again, using sort of like this clinical perspective of, based on the nature of the self as it's understood in the Islamic, in the Islamic perspective, um, you need measurements in order to be able to diagnose that person. It's not just enough to say, oh, the Quran says this or the Quran says that. That's your starting point. But then bringing it into the realm of science, I, I see no problem with coming up with um, with psychometric scales and assessments to be able to diagnose with some somebody if they have a disease of the heart or a disease of the nafs or something of that. So that's an example of of bringing what we have in the world of theology and religion into the world of science and how I understand that Islamic psychology is still a science. And and this also kind of me being a nerd, you know, this also brings up the idea of epistemology. You know, what are our sources of knowledge or the nature of knowledge or principles that we use to understand what is true or real? And then, of course, you know, because some people might go, well, scientific empiricism, as we know it today, already has an established framework which could limit the contours of, let's say, developing other branches of scientific methodology to sort of measure things like diseases of the heart or, you know, the energy presence of jinn. Islamic psychology in the future will have to perhaps broaden or 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 um, change some of the contours of what is considered a scientific method, so to speak. 
there's two things um, that there, there's there's two different approaches that can be taken in tandem to address exactly what you're talking about. On the one hand, I think in 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 the sort of early days of the emergence of an Islamic psychology discipline, I see no problem with using some of the same scientific methodologies that we use in mainstream psychology think that in the beginning, because there's a lot of misconception and misunderstanding in the world of psychology about what religious psychologies are, a lot of psychologists think that religious psychology is Christian psychology, Buddhist psychology, that it's just religion and theology. And so there's that misconception. And so I think that when you say, hold on, wait a second, that, that that's not true. We are, maybe that used to be true, but in a modern way, no, we are using the same scientific methodologies that mainstream psychology uses within this framework. So it gives a kind of legitimacy um, and it and it kind of speaks to this misunderstanding that people have that, oh, it's just religion and theology that we're doing. Other approach I think that can, needs to be taken or that will be taken as the discipline matures is um, expansion of the methodologies that are used. And I, and I think that that mainstream psychology is currently undergoing this expansion. So whether you're looking at spiritual research um, or even things like decolonized research methodologies, um, there's a whole host of expanding research methods that are now being used in the psychological sciences um, that can also be used in an emerging um, Islamic psychology discipline. Right. Yeah, I mean, what comes up for me is, you know, when you look at when Islam spread out of Arabia, and the Islamic civilizations started to, you know, contribute to all these fields like astronomy and physics and biology and, and, and human sciences. I mean, many of the, our scholars in the past, they studied the masters that preceded them. Right. So they use these frameworks and then almost kind of re-expressed some of these ideas through an Islamic lens or added to it, so to speak. So is that kind of a similar evolution that could potentially happen when it comes to Islamic psychology? That can, that can be part of it. But specifically when we're talking about methodologies that will be used in the discipline, um, I, th I again, I think that we can start off with sort of the methodologies that are standard and acceptable within within. In mainstream psychology and science, and that we can, as 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 the discipline gets strength and can, look, you know, sort of start to stand on its own two feet, um, then we can start to expand the methods that we use and and, and incorporate other methodologies that maybe aren't current as, as currently um, recognized as as um, as the ones we use today. Yeah, I mean, a lot of what came up for me when you were sharing this feedback was this idea of cultural psychology and and just like you have you know american psychological association there's probably like an indian psychological association or egyptian psychological association and perhaps one day inshallah there can be ipa islamic psychological association which really you know encapsulates all of this stuff together and defines its branches accordingly perhaps yeah, I, I definitely think that that's um you know, I, there are some organizations, I really can't recall what the specific names of them are, but I know that there's like, you know, groups on LinkedIn and other things related to Islamic psychology. But a lot of these things are kind of, you know, they're not like properly academic, scholarly in nature, like, you know, something like the APA is or something along those lines. So there are, there's sort of interest groups out there, but I think that that could be, you know, a, a development in the ev evolution of the discipline. Um, I think once, once we, we could get to that point. Dr. Carey, it's been an honor to have you on today. I think we've had a very rich uh, discussion about the reality of, of, of this discipline materializing. And I'd love to hear, you know, in closing, your vision of why you 
have this intention and this role to consolidate the different scholars, the different work that's out there. And what is your intention or vision for how Islamic psychology as a discipline can, inshallah, evolve and crystallize? There's scholarship all over the place. There's um, people, you know, integrating spirituality into psychotherapy. There's research going on over the last 10 or 20 years. And I just want to bring that together and consolidate it so that we can move things forward in a proper discipline. So that's kind of like what I see my role as, um, or at least that's my intention. The second thing that I want to say is that the vision and bigger goal that I'm working towards and why I think it's so important to bring everybody together, the ultimate goal is to one day, I am working with the intention of establishing the first um, APA accredited um, graduate degree program in Islamic psychology. You can get a degree in Buddhist psychology, Christian psychology, Christian, psych Christian schools have psychology departments in them that grant degrees. We do not have that yet with, with Islamic psychology um, uh, coming from an Islamic school. And so, you know, this is my vision. This is what I envision for Islamic psychology. This is what I believe that can happen five, 10 years down the road. And this is what all of my efforts are working towards is the, the, the establishment and development of that. Beautiful vision, and I totally support that. It says in the Quran, we must come together and, and hold to the rope of Allah and uh, don't separate. And so I love that you have this intention of unifying, you know, the the scholars and, and um, academics in this field to kind of bring it all together and let's and let's manifest this and materialize it, inshallah. The, well, and I would just say one one thing, you know, sort of um, piggybacking on top of that is that it absolutely not only is it like a, a, a collective effort, but it has to be a multidisciplinary effort. It has to be people. It, it can't just be psychologists because we don't have the theological knowledge and the theologians can't do it without us because they don't they're not psychologists. It needs to be uh, an interdis you know, an, an interdisciplinary effort with people with diverse um, areas of expertise, um, whether, it's, whether it's on a small research project or whether it's on a big project of establishing a school of psychology. We need, you know, people with a multitude of, of um, disciplines. And so, you know, I would just say, you know, absolutely. It's about bringing people of different expertise together. Excellent. Excellent. Dr. Kerry, it has been a pleasure and uh, honor to have you on the show today. And I pray that Allah SWT helps you manifest your intention and vision. And I'm certainly a supporter of, of that. So thanks again for, for sharing your valuable time with us. And I hope, well, and I hope uh, everyone benefited from, from learning more about the future of Islamic psychology. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. I'm Siraj Adin here. Thank you for tuning in. Please visit NurHuman.com to learn more about how I provide personal, spiritual, and relationship counsel and growth. Don't forget to visit CoffeeWithKareem.com to see the latest news and updates about this podcast. Please generously help sponsor this show to keep on going at Patreon.com slash CoffeeWithKareem. That's Patreon.com slash CoffeeWithKareem.